Welcome to the Cambridge Tech Podcast, talking all things technology from the heart of the UK's tech capital. Here are your hosts, Faye Holland and James Parton. Hi, I'm Faye. And there's no James. I'm flying solo on this week's guest recording. As you'll know, we have a very broad range of tech covered on Cambridge Tech Podcast. And today we're looking at a digital health tech startup called Curate, which is using AI to identify and treat severe respiratory disease. So I'm super interested to dig a little bit deeper on what this all means with CEO and co-founder Mahanthan Tilai. Hi, Mahanthan. Welcome to Cambridge Tech Podcast. Thanks, Faith. Thank you very much for having me on your podcast. I'm delighted because I finally got you on the show. You were actually one of our very first invitations back in October 2022. We've had to reschedule because you are like super, super busy. Uh, we are unbelievably busy and I find I'm rescheduling everything, including like taking my kids to the cinema all the time. The last six months has been insane, but that's life of a startup, I guess. Right. Well, I'm not sure that we can help with the children and going to the cinema (laughs) situation. And I would definitely prioritize that. But let's let's definitely find out what has been happening over over the last few months. And I have to ask you this one, first of all, because I just said, let's talk about Curate first of all. And you're like, no, 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 that's not how you say it's Curate. So first of all, you know, as a branding comms person, talk me through that. Yeah, interesting journey. So three or four years ago, when we set up the company, a group of us uh, founders, we had three at the time, we have two now, thought about names. And the idea was that we would take data from clinical trials and try and understand it better. And we came up with this idea of a museum curator, a sort of man or a woman doing the night shift in a museum, they would curate the data. So we had curate, C-U-R-A-T-E, but lots of companies had that name. And somehow we brought in Q, I'm not entirely sure how, and somehow it turned into Q-U-R, and then 8-E-I-G-H-T. And then a couple of years ago, we had Q-U-R and the number eight, but now we've settled on just Q-U-R-E-I-G-H-T. We're updating our website. We'll be clear that curate means curate healthcare data. Perfect. You know, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? Sometimes I think we make life quite difficult for ourselves, but but yes, we <laughs> great. We, we're, going to, we're going to help to dispel that myth there as well. Okay, so tell me, then what does Curate do? You've given us a quick example, but what's your elevator pitch as to what Curate does? So Curate looks at healthcare data from clinical trials in lung disease and heart disease. We have a cloud-based platform where we take uh, data, predominantly images, so scans of the lungs or the heart, biomarkers, physiology type tests, blood tests, and we structure them on our platform using AI. And by doing that, we look for signals within the data. And so to give you a very clear example, you might be a pharma company running a small phase two study in a certain complex lung disease. You have a primary endpoint, you have a secondary endpoint, and you may get to the end of the study and your study may work perfectly, or your study may fail badly, or you may be in what we call the amber zone, where you're unsure as to whether this 20 or 30 million pounds you spent uh, is worth further investment. By structuring the data and looking for meaningful biological signals, We aim to give you a really clear idea as to has your drug worked or not, and how has it worked, and how can we help you deliver more value. So you as a pharma company might say, well, look, the drug really doesn't work, let's shelve this. Or we didn't think the drug worked, but Curate has built us a model on their platform that suggests a biological reason for why the drug might work. Maybe we should invest more money into it. Maybe we should actually take this drug forward. And we've started working with a number of pharmaceutical companies over the last 12 months, running live clinical trials on our platform in complex lung diseases, taking this data, structuring it, and really helping them answer that simple question, do my drugs work or not? Right. Okay. So I want to come back and talk about the companies, your target, the pharmaceutical organizations in a moment, but let's stay at the beginning if we can. So you founded this company three years ago, uh, sorry, 2018, that's five years ago, if my maths works properly. (laughs) And you just said there were three founders and now there's two. So you're medical professionals. How did that actually happen? I am a a lung doctor, a lung specialist. I work in a big hospital in Cambridge called Patworth. And as you know, I've drop down a lot of my time and I, I do one day a week seeing patients. But a few years ago when I was full time, I met a colleague of mine, Alessandro, who's a, a radiologist and imaging doctor. 
And then we met a, a third person, a, a bioinformatician who understood data. And it's one of those typical Cambridge stories. We met at a conference, we started talking, we went out for a couple of beers. And one day we were sitting in a pub called uh, the Pickerel Inn, which is on a lovely bridge where the punting is in Cambridge. It's, it's one of those pubs that's four or 500 years old. And we were just talking about a research project. And I said, and I remember this vividly, I said to those two guys, I said, look, I've done research. I don't want to spend the rest of my life doing research. Let's turn this idea into a company. And we just started. And yes, we've been going for five years. But the truth is, for the first three years, it was just two or three of us with no money bumbling along. It's only been the last couple of years that things have taken off. We've had venture capital investment and we've now got a bigger team. So noting that you've said you still do some medical practice, and we can come back to that too, how was that jump going from research and medical practice to startup land? You know, it wasn't that hard. In one respect, it's horrendous because as everyone listening who's worked in a startup invested in a startup, it takes over your entire life. But I think being a doctor, especially in the NHS, you devote a lot of your life to medicine and healthcare. And you run teams of people and you work with different disciplines and you have targets to meet. So from that respect, actually, the skills you learn as a doctor or as a researcher and a scientist, because I also have a science background, are really transferable. Now, there's a whole load of business that we've had to learn over the last few years. We have a formal board. We have business people that help us with investment. But actually running a team and bringing key people together, these are transferable skills. And I think if you're a good doctor or a good scientist, you know, potentially you might be a good founder. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, isn't it? Um, those, those transferable skills Definitely. come in very handy, don't they? They do. Okay, no, thank you for that. And when so when you were setting the, the company up, you got involved in things like the Judge Business School. Were there, you know, what were those key yeah, um, I, I think... conversations you had and where did you get help from? I can't emphasize how important the Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge was to us. We we joined a, a lady called Hannah Di Gibardo was uh, running at the time, and she kindly gave us a place. I remember the interview, actually. We went. She had one space left on the accelerator, and I think I said, what's an accelerator? And she looked at me as if I was mad. Um, so she gave us a space, and we met business people, mentors, lawyers. We found out how to incorporate a company. We understood legal documents, how to build a team. And in the very early days, they were absolutely fundamental. Um, and the thing about Cambridge is it's a very, very small place. You have investors, you have highly talented tech people. And through the university, you get to meet some of them at the judge. So uh, I think the judge was fundamental to where we are today. Yeah. And, and Hannity, you know, that was a, a good relationship you formed for a variety of reasons, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So Hannity was on our board as an investor director for a couple of years. She's recently um, stepped down and been replaced by someone else from her fund. But um, she's someone I have a huge amount of respect for. She's very big in the Cambridge ecosystem. Um, I, I count her as a mentor and actually now as a friend. And she gives amazing advice, sometimes very brutal, but that's what you want as a founder. But is really very honest and open. And I think finding people like her throughout her journey has, has, has been absolutely key to, to, to our success. Yeah, and she's now, uh, for, for hand, she's now Deputy Lord Lieutenant as well, isn't she? She's, she is, yeah. I've seen some very fancy photos of her in newspapers. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she'll, she'll, she'll love that one. Okay, so let's let's get back to the matter in hand with Curate now. So you talked a little bit in the introduction about what it is that, that you're doing and looking at these scans and data. Was there a main problem that you were trying to solve? And then secondly, can we delve a little bit into the technology, you know, and how you're using technology? Yeah, so the main problem actually came from myself as a doctor. So I work in an area of complex lung diseases are called interstitial lung diseases and that that was my area specialty it still is it's what i do one day a week in these are diseases where the lungs become quite scarred and damaged and they're very difficult to monitor and we have two drugs both approved four or five years ago these are billion dollar drugs made by big pharma they cost the nhs a lot of money and, and i as a doctor prescribe these drugs and yet now and even then i used to struggle to work out whether these drugs were really working or not we have very clear endpoints in this disease we have breathing tests but we do scans, we do biomarkers, and in my head, I have to, as a doctor, put all that data together and try and understand whether the drug is working or not. And I remember thinking a few years ago, well, if it was hard enough for me as a doctor who trained in this, imagine if you're a pharma company, you're trying to build the next drug. How do you bring in experts like me? How do you understand what your data is doing? And it was that really clear idea that we need to understand how these drugs are working. And then if you work backwards in the drug approval process in the early clinical trials, how do we get limited data, you know, limited scans or biomarkers and try and put it together? So for me, it was that first disease, IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is the first of three diseases we've been looking at in Curate that we've kind of really pushed ahead in. 
So you saw the need, you you come up with this solution, and then you've got to build the system. How did you go about that? Obviously, you made a key hire a couple of years ago to really work on the platform. So just just talk us through the platform and how that's evolved. You know, we have a growing team now, but our key hire, who's now our chief technology officer, was Darren Gallagher. Darren works at a company called Autonomy was acquired by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. At one point, he was um, head of platform technology globally for HP Enterprise. He left, retired early. uh, And again, another situation, somebody said, do you want to meet Darren? I met him in a pub. I remember this pub, it was called the Cambridge Brew House. So I think our story will be pubs around Cambridge. Met at the Cambridge Brew House, and I spent two hours persuading Darren that he should come and work with us. And luckily he did, and, and he's helped us build a tech team. So the technology at the beginning was quite simple. We didn't understand AI, but we knew that other companies and other people out there were building AI in lung disease. We decided that if we could build a platform, a safe space to put data in AI, we wouldn't need to build our own AI. We could bring other data and another AI in. We worked very first with a company called Galapagos, which were a Belgian pharmaceutical company. They were a big company. Um, and they had a very specific question uh, looking at airways and lung disease. And so we found a company in Europe that had developed some airway software. We had some data from the UK and Galapagos, and we just put it together on our platform and ran some studies. And after Darren came on, we started to work with machine learning engineers in Cambridge and elsewhere and started to realize that some of these algorithms out there that were approved for use um, in hospitals were maybe not that great. They hadn't been tested on the best data and the the clearest data. And we decided that if we could sign partnerships with hospitals across the UK and abroad to get in this first disease IPF the best data, we could then bring in the best machine learning image scientists to then build our own algorithms. And so for the last year and a half, We've been building our own algorithms and we now have proprietary technology looking at various aspects of the lung, volumes, blood vessels, fibrosis, scarring. And the platform on the cloud simply runs these algorithms. If you gave us data, whether you were a pharma company or a hospital, we would apply our algorithms, run a series of models and try and come up with some answers. And it's all done in a cloud-based platform that we've developed ourselves. Data-wise, it's a classic of, you know, if you've got junk data, then you're not going to get the right results. So so actually building your own seems to be the, the most logical approach. So how who else have you worked with to get that data? Are you running trials on it? You know, where, where are you up to on that journey? We work with pharma companies who've either finished a trial and we access their data, or we've started, we've just, we haven't announced, but we've just started a a large phase two trial in the US taking real-time data from US hospitals. So as we run those studies, we can use that data to help build our models. But you also work with healthcare. So uh, we have partnerships with hospitals across the UK. We recently, with the University of Birmingham, uh, announced a big collaboration. Now, Birmingham in the UK are the largest uh, NHS trust in the UK. And we're building them a structured data set that they can use, but we can also use to help our models get better. So for us, it's how do we use real world data to make the models better? But perhaps more importantly, how do we use this pharma trial data? Because pharma trial data is very structured. It comes in at certain time points, certain scans and biomarkers happen on certain regular intervals. And those really structured data sets allow us to build what we think are very accurate models of disease progression in these diseases. You're going for all markets then so you talked about the uk you've talked about the us there's there's no restriction in in where you can run this and that's really key because we're not building clinical decision support software we made a decision a while ago that our journey is not how do we get regulatory approved software into hospitals that's that's a different journey and a very worthwhile journey but for us, the, the reason we set up the company is how do we influence clinical trials and get the right drugs to right patients. And actually for that, we have a ISO 13485, we have a QMS system, we have a set of regulation. Working with a pharma company in Japan or the US or, or Europe really is exactly the same. We're agnostic to where we take the data from. And because we're cloud-based, we don't have physical servers anywhere. We can extract data from anywhere in the world onto our cloud system. Right. And it, I think it's really, really interesting as well, because there is also that sustainability angle, because the wastage in drugs and misuse and misprescription, you know, that actually there's, there's a huge, you know, element of that as well, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, there's a huge element of wastage in drugs as a, as a doctor of, as I said at the beginning, prescribing drugs, and I don't know if they're working. Yeah. But there's also a huge element of wastage in pharma. If you're a pharma company and you spent, let's say, 30 or 40 million pounds on a small trial you might ditch that drug quite quickly 
But you may be able to give a company like us the data and we may say, well, actually, that drug does work. Or maybe it works in a slightly different way. Maybe we built you a blood vessel model that shows that it doesn't work on airways in the lung, but it works on blood vessels. And actually, if you're a company and you spent all that money and, and importantly, you've recruited all those patients who've given up their time and tried these experimental drugs, then you have a duty to be absolutely sure before you shelve a drug that, that it's not going to be worthwhile. And I think that's another, another really key area where we can help companies where they run a trial, they finished, and they don't think the drug works, but let's be absolutely sure we're using some kind of new technology. Is it a limitless number of applications that you can use this for? You know, so so you're starting with the what you know, that was that was how the business came about. You're starting with lung heart, you know, but I guess it can apply to so many other things. It can. So the platform, uh, when we talk about scans, can extract and segment, which means just divide up scans of any part of the body. We can take CT scans of the chest. We can take MRI scans of the brain. We can take x-rays of your spine. We've chosen to stay in lung and heart disease for now because the markets there are big enough. And our first disease was IPF. Our, our second and third diseases we're about to announce are uh, pulmonary hypertension and lung cancer, which is a massive market. But we think commercially, heart and lung disease is enough for us for a focus. Uh, and if we grow beyond that at some stage, great. But right now we're focused just on those two kind of large systems. Are you a data-driven business looking for resilient infrastructure, connectivity, and the power to compute sustainably? KO Data develops and operates high-performance, energy-efficient data centers for advanced computing. Our scalable, state-of-the-art facilities support the mission-critical workloads of life sciences, biotech and AI startups across the Cambridge Tech Cluster. To find out how we can help host your compute, get in touch at kodata.com slash contact. KO Data, proud to sponsor the Cambridge Tech Podcast. Moving on to the commercial side of it now, you've talked about the work you're doing with Birmingham. Pharma companies are notoriously difficult to engage with, to work with, you know, to get, I guess once you're in there, it's it's somewhat easier. But where are you up to in terms of commercial relationships? Yeah, so I can tell you, uh, and more this will be public on our website, uh, a couple of things. So we're working with seven, eight pharma companies, from very large ones to very small ones. The most important of which is that uh, by the time this podcast comes out, we'll have announced a, a multi-year strategic collaboration with AstraZeneca to use our platform in a range of research and development technologies. Now, for us, that's a deal we only signed today, actually. So it's hot off the press um, and we haven't, we haven't announced it, but it will be by the time this podcast comes out. That's a major inflection point for us to, to sign a multi-year agreement with a big pharma company is huge. But them aside, with all the other companies, and, and you'll see some of them on our, on our updated website, for us, it's been how do we get into the science and the medical people? Lots of companies at our stage go and hire lots of BD people and try and sell through BD. We realized early on that that wouldn't work. We, we just don't have the resources. What we do have is a deep understanding of the medicine and the science because we're doctors and scientists. And so for each of these companies, we started relationships with the medical teams, the scientific team, showed them our technology under CDA, taught what we could do. And once we got them really interested, and yes, it takes a long time in pharma, actually the switch over to them asking the, the commercial people to jump into a contract becomes very, very easy. And that's been a successful route for us, and I don't think we'll change that. Even if we grow a very, very big uh, business development team, for now, um, following the science, following the medicine, and then using those people to switch on the commercial people, um, it is going to be our key strategy. That is so exciting for you. It must be a real pinch me moment, and I'm so I'm so happy I mean, it's not off the press. But obviously, it's, it'll be it's literally a uh, contract yeah. signed about sixty minutes ago. So uh, it's been it's been a while in the making, and and for us, it's massive. I mean, AstraZeneca they're a global pharmaceutical company, and they have a real deep understanding of the science, which is what excites us the most. And and they have a range of ideas for a test out on our platform, and, and we're really excited. This doesn't mean we can't work with other, other big companies, and we are, but this is without a doubt the most important agreement you know we, we've signed today okay so to, to ground us back down I want to go back to something you said earlier on in the conversation about you actually are still working in medicine you're actually still practicing just one day a week at the moment and that has 
<laughs> at this stage of the company, and I don't think this will always be possible, huge advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are it keeps me sane and I can't ever imagine not being a doctor because I love seeing patients. I love speaking to patients. I, I don't like the politics of um, the NHS, but I love just being in a clinic room, doing I still do procedures, lung biopsies on patients and doing that. And I love that. The disadvantages are when you work one day a week, primarily, if I order a CT scan or a blood result, I sometimes can't wait a week to look at that. So I'll get emails, I'll get um, calls from junior doctors or our specialist nurses saying, can you chase this result? Can you do that? And that can become quite difficult. So I think there's, there's a trade-off. If, if I was an A&E, an emergency room doctor, it'd be easier. I'd go and do my shift and walk away. But as a physician, you have to always look after these patients. And I can't just see a patient say goodbye because I'll see them two months later. So that is definitely a challenge. And it's, it's something I'm, I'm sort of trying to work out how to, to overcome. Yeah, so another thing that's going in your juggle mix from the top of the call as well. You know, there are things I've dramatically cut down. So, for example, um, as a hospital consultant, I did a reasonable amount of private practice. Most of my colleagues do. I made a decision two or three years ago to stop, so I don't see any private patients. Uh, even though my salary and you know salary of a startup drops a lot, but I'm I'm quite happy. Um, I've dropped a lot of my research commitments, and I was until again a couple of years ago until our last funding round from from venture capital i was the head of a department the the lung disease department in cambridge and i gave that up completely so i've dropped quite a lot uh, but this this one day a week is the last thing i'm i'm holding on to as long as i can <laughs> Surely it gives you some context as well. It keeps you on the edge so you know exactly what's happening and, and maybe can help, you know, with curators as it's addressing needs too. It massively helps with curate because when I go into a meeting with a, a sort of chief medical officer of a biotech company, they're very interested that I'm the CEO and co-founder of Curate, but sometimes they're much more interested in the fact that I see patients with their diseases and I have that unique respect. Some of these companies previously, you know, would pay me and my, they pay my colleagues, they used to pay me to come and advise them lots of money. And so I'm now giving them advice for free about drug decisions and patients. And, and sometimes that's far more valuable than just being the founder of a tech company. So I think you're right, even commercially at this stage, it makes sense for me to keep seeing patients. Right, so I'm going to move us on now and we're going to talk funding. Um, so co considering this, like I said at the beginning, was one of the reasons that we, we kept deferring the, the conversation with you. Um, where are you up to? Who are your funders? Um, you know, how's, how's that all worked? You know, how's it been pitching and doing all of those types of things that were, were, would have been completely new to you? Yeah, really hard. So I think first it's key to say we're not fundraising at the moment because we're in a lucky position that we have a reasonable amount of revenue, which is growing. Um, so we're making a decision at the board over the summer, actually, as to when and where you should go and fundraise, and we will, and what that quantum should be. We've raised two million pounds to date, and actually uh, half a million, maybe about three years ago, and then 1.5 million about a year and a half ago was our, our formal seed round. We have angels, Cambridge angels, a number of them, probably most importantly is a guy called Simon Thorpe, who invested a small amount at the very beginning, is a very active Cambridge angel, but we have five of them on our cap table now. And then VC funds, at the very beginning, a fund called CMS Ventures, based out of Hong Kong, who had an office in Cambridge. Uh, and then in the 1.5 million round, VCs in London. So led by Playfair, who are a tech VC in London, uh, Ascension Life Fund in London, and Meltwind, who are in Cambridge. So we now have three or four VCs and a few angels on our cap table. And as I said, we're in, in a fortunate position at the moment. We won't always be, but at the moment we don't need funding. But we will make that decision to go out soon. And by the time this podcast comes out, we may have made that decision. It's a very different journey. You know, pitching for funding, asking people for money is a very difficult process, as everybody knows. And that's something as a doctor and a scientist you don't have skills with. I, I can write grant applications, but to walk into a room or get onto a Zoom call and say, this is what we do, give me some money, that's a totally different kind of skill, which which I'm starting to, to learn. So alongside with that, you know, you have the investors, you looking to build a board, you know, you're having this meeting, you know, obviously you have regular meetings, but, you know, what's it been like building the board? Because sometimes the investors are on the board, you know, you can't necessarily pick them, although you've got good relationships, so it works out. You've got a scientific advisory board. What's it been like doing that and getting the right people around you to support what the, you know, your vision of the journey is? Advisory board's been easy and fun. I can deal with that quickly. So these are global people, men and women in complex lung disease and then soon heart disease space. Some of them big ex-pharma people, some of them professors. They're fun and they're easy to work with and, and that's good. The board is also fun, uh, but like all boards can be challenging. Uh, and, and they're there to challenge us as founders and challenge me as a CEO. That's their role. 
We have a couple of investor directors, um, a non-executive director who's fantastic, a lady called Caroline Austin, who is actually in BD at AstraZeneca, and we have some observers. Most importantly, and I think this has been fundamental, about three months ago, we appointed a chairperson, again, uh, on the down low, but uh, in September this year, we'll announce that person now. He is an individual who's American, he's based on the West Coast, he's a C-level executive at a, at, at a massive NASDAQ-listed you know, billion dollar med tech company. And working with him for the past three or four months has been fundamental. And, and actually having a chairperson to shape the board has taken a huge weight off my shoulders. Before um, he came on board, I would run the board meetings. Now, um, yes, I'm, I'm a main player, uh, but I'm, I'm not the person running the meetings, which, which surprisingly, um, and others will know this, has taken a huge weight off my shoulders and made, made it much, much easier to navigate the board. It's part of the journey, isn't it? It's part of just moving forward, building the team, surrounding yourself with the people that actually are going to be able to help you achieve what you need to. Well, there's a team of the board. It's finding the right people who can help with fundraising, who can help with strategy, who can help with the really difficult questions of where are we going and why are we going. And in this person's, our chairperson's view, actually most of it has been don't do this you know at the beginning he said you're trying to do too much just stop doing all this stuff and really focus and and by doing so it's opened up huge commercial possibilities for us and and that's the exciting bit isn't it so you can chase lots of funding you can chase lots of opportunities but like you said you're you're getting revenue in and that has to be the the best way of uh, 100 percent. i mean to give you a clear example seven or eight months ago we were talking to a company about Alzheimer's and doing some brain AI. Now, we could have gone down that route, uh, but our chairperson said, look, you guys understand lung disease and heart disease. The total addressable market for those is massive. Just focus on this and forget everything else. And that was absolutely the right thing to do. Perfect. So you've been quite vocal with advice to other startups. And, you know, I think people listening in, whether they're a startup or just generally interested, will, will have found it really interesting. But what would your advice be? to others that are on the startup journey? So many things. I mean, I'm by no means an expert in that. There are lots of amazing, much bigger companies out there, even in Cambridge. But I think a couple of things. You, you obviously, you have to identify a problem. That's key. But it can't be, um, you know, you're sitting at home drinking a beer one night and have an idea. It has to be a real problem that you found. And the most important piece of advice I would argue for is find a customer quickly. It doesn't matter if they pay you or not, but we've learned so much from our pharma clients. They've looked at our platform. They've asked us to radically change things and change things in little ways. And our platform build and what we've been doing has been influenced by our clients. Now, if we'd been building in secret with tech people and, you know, very, very smart data people, we may have made a really amazing platform and then got it out there. And our clients would have said, this is nonsense. You know, regardless of whether you're on a VC back journey or a revenue journey, whether you're a product company or a service company, if you're in tech, especially med tech, try and find a customer early and get some feedback. That would be my most important advice. You've given lots of examples. You know, you've got the announcement with AstraZeneca. You've got the board meeting coming up. Um, you know, maybe some more more fundraising. So you've kind of given some some suggestions of what's next for Curate in the shorter term. So I'm going to ask you the question slightly differently. Where do you want to be, whether it's three, five years? You know, how will you know you're in the right place? If I jump forward five years, and let's say we haven't either A, been acquired or B, gone out of business because we run out of money. Let's say neither of those have happened and we're still building a very big company. If we still only stayed in heart and lung disease, and I talk about that because within that, a disease like lung cancer, which is massive, or um, heart failure or ischemic heart disease, which is massive. If our platform could structure data from clinical trials around the world and real world data, put it in one place, build some models that were of value to pharma companies and value to drug inflection points globally in a range of different diseases, um, then I think we'd be in an amazing place. And for me, as, as a legacy for what we're doing, that would be a difficult but achievable goal. And that's what we're doing for. If, if you ran, as a pharma company, a heart disease study or a lung disease study, and Curate was the first name that popped into your head to do your digital analytics and your endpoint analysis and your AI, we would be in an amazing place. Brilliant. Well, look, I'm, I'm sure that you carry on on the trajectory that you are doing. You'll, you'll, you'll be there. Let's ignore the other, the other options yeah. <laughs> you mentioned. Okay, so to wrap up, James always is like, you can't ask personal questions. Yeah, of course I can ask. You can always say no. <laughs> um, so 
linking everything together, you've got the family commitments, the yep. company commitments, you practicing physician, you've got all of these different things going on. Now, when I was first doing the research, and this is way back in October, but I'm still going to say it anyway, you just bought a stack of books. And <laughs> it included that one from Haruki Murakami, yep, uh, yep. who I love, by the way. Yep, and yep. So, so my question is, did you read them all? Honestly, yes. It's the one thing I do. So, you know, we've got two young kids, so they, they have to come first above every day to my wife, they, and she agrees. They have to come first about everything, above curate, hospitals, they come first. But putting them aside, the one thing I do is read because I absolutely love reading and I don't have time to watch TV. I rarely go to the cinema. I have time for nothing apart from work. Books are such an important part of my life. Um, Japanese culture, um, Asian culture. I was born in Sri Lanka, so books from South India and Sri Lanka. And, and just any kind of novel, any kind of story, that escapism is is the most important thing for me without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, I love it. And and so this is one for me as well, personally. Yeah. I cannot, I can't read on a Kindle. Right. I don't, I you know, I, it's got to be a book. It's got Faye, to be. A book. I, I must have three or four Kindles. Every time a Kindle comes out, I buy it. I use it for a month and then I throw it in the corner. Yeah. And they're all stacked up. I can't read in a Kindle. I have to. So we're going. We're going on holiday to Greece next week with some friends and us as families. And I've got a couple of books and. I just have to have that physical book no matter what. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? And so this is probably telling you way too yeah. much. But I mean, I'm in it. I'm in it now. So I can't read a second handbook. So I, I like a brand new book. There's something nice, that? isn't there? There's something nice about, um, there's a Japanese word, I don't know what it is, for someone who just buys books and new and leaves them. So that's my worry that I buy books and leave them. But you're right, opening that brand new book, that smell is, is it's like a new car smell. It is unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Well, listen, yeah. thank you so much for coming on to the podcast, month, and it's been really great talking to you. And and the journey, I think, is so exciting, and we wish you all the very best. Fantastic, Faye. And, and just a shout out to us. So if when this comes out, you read about us and you see we have opened a funding round, then uh, if you're lucky, you may be able to get into that. Just uh, come and find me. <laughs> Love it. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. To wrap this week's episode, I have four pieces of news for you. First of all, a number of Cambridge Chip Technology Thought Leaders participated in the inaugural meeting of the UK government's new semiconductor advisory panel. Cambridge representatives on the panel include Scott White of Pragmatic, Amelia Amor of Amadeus Capital Partners, Dr Eben Upton of Raspberry Pi and Richard Grissenthwaite of Arm. And the feedback was upbeat. Scott White, friend of the podcast, told Business Weekly... It was a good first meeting and discussion. The key to the success of the initiative will be figuring out how we can get some tangible decisions on implementation of the strategy that translates into real outcomes for the sector and the UK as a whole. So I'm sure there will be more news on that to follow. Next, ZAR PLC, the inkjet printing technology group, anticipates a pickup in the market in China in the second half of the year as it deploys a growing pipeline of print heads. It also anticipates more product launches to keep pace with demand. ZAR revenue for the first half of 2023 was slightly down from £36.6 million to £34.7 million, but the company reports a strong balance sheet and cash of £7.3 million. Third up, Cambridge cleantech venture PaveGen is to raise an unspecified but substantial sum from a crowd fundraise to underpin further global expansion. PaveGen created these incredible interactive floor tiles to convert footsteps into small amounts of electrical energy, or data insights, or even engagement points for global brands, businesses and governments. The company was founded in 2009 by Lawrence Kendall Cook and has already delivered projects for global brands like Ford, Kia and Volvo Cars, so if you haven't checked them out, please do go look at them. And finally, the fourth item, James has asked if I can plug a special event coming up at the Bradfield Centre on the 25th of August at 2pm. It's the first graduation from the Tech Educators Coding Boot Camp, which is based at the Bradfield Centre, and it's supported by both Mantle Space and the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority with the aim of helping to bridge the local skills gap. The students in this first cohort have been taught the Mernstack and Next.js. Everyone is invited to come along and see firsthand what the students have been learning, what they can do, celebrate their graduating, 
and maybe even hire them. So find the link to register on bradfieldcenter.com. Today's show was produced by Carl Homer of Cambridge TV and supported by our media partner, Business Weekly. The Cambridge Tech Podcast is available on all major podcast platforms and on cambridgetechpodcast.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please give it a five-star review. It will really help others discover the show. If you are a startup looking to grow in Cambridge, the Bradfield Centre offers a range of flexible membership packages which put you in control of your office and home working mix. There's a vibrant, collaborative atmosphere, on-site cafe, plenty of green outside space and regular member social events. For more information, visit bradfieldcentre.com or call 01223 919 600.